Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu, and thank you so much for joining us for this February episode of the podcast. Once again, it's me and T.R. Eckler having a little conversation, and this time we're talking about opioids and pediatrics and opioids. It's a great conversation. Before we dive in, I want to remind you that ebmedicine.net is your one-stop shop for three different journals. That's emergency medicine practice, pediatric emergency medicine practice, and evidence-based urgent care, all three of which are available to you in the mobile app, searchable with all of that CME right at your fingertips, and clinical pathways. That's clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net brand new interactive version of all those pathways that we publish every month in all three journals. I just can't wait for you to see it. Go take a look, leave me some feedback. And now let's jump into the conversation with TR. Here we are again with Dr. TR Eckler talking all things opioids. It is February 2023 and several things have happened to make me want to sit down with Dr. Eckler and have this discussion. First was the repeal of the DEA X waiver or data waiver. Second was the publication of responsible and safe use of opioids in children and adolescents in the emergency department. There you go. That was the January 1st, 2023 pediatric emergency medicine practice article. And third was a general discussion about buprenorphine and appropriate opioid use in adults and children. And there are actually two other articles published in EB Medicine Journals, one for pediatrics called Pediatric Pain Management in the Emergency Department, and one for adults called Emergency Department Pain Management Beyond Opioids. Both of those were published in 2019, so there is already a large volume of information in the EB Medicine Library regarding opioids and pain management in both adults and children. And so we thought we'd sit down today and just review some of those things. I have a particular interest in this opioids in pediatrics article because I read it and honestly, it taught me a few things. But before we dive into that, the DEA X waiver. Now, I never actually went through the process of getting one, but you did. So my hospital in Colorado was really investing a lot of money in opiate treatment and in trying to find better ways to address the problem that they had with patients with opiate addiction. And They had a training where doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs could get paid to get a DEA X waiver. And I went through that process, if only to really understand how to approach this and how to do it, but then didn't feel like it was something that we could completely manage from the emergency department and managed to get other stakeholders in the community between mental health, primary care, and then outreaches from the state government that were basically doing like mobile clinics for treatment. They came down to my little rural town in Colorado, in Trinidad, Colorado, and they basically started doing almost every day a week, except I think Sunday, having some sort of mobile treatment that we could treat with buprenorphine, discharge a patient with a dose for later that day or the next day, and then they could follow up in 24 to 48 hours with somebody that would then institute further treatment for them. And it was a really cool program to be a part of and to get to see that kind of launch because I think it it is really something that if you give people a chance, like what we were talking about this, the NNT for, for treatment is if you give two people buprenorphine, one of them will stay in opiate treatment going forward. So I think if that's what this is, then sure, I'll give two people treatment to get one of them to stay on treatment and to stay off of, of the other things that they're addicted to. And the program you were a part of was successful. You saw Very much people so. turn around their lives and improve. And it was, uh, it was successful, at least in your regional area. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was something that everybody, all the stakeholders were really interested in making it happen. So for me, it didn't take that much energy to just push the ball down the hill and say, okay, the ER is going to start this if everyone will follow along and everyone really jumped up and took on a day. And my biggest goal was like, hey, let's not have all of your clinics open just on Monday and Tuesday. Let's spread your services out so that we can make sure that people have access because people don't have their emergencies just on Monday and Tuesday when they decide that today's the day for help. So it worked really well, and it made me feel like there's a lot of people interested in, in trying to address this problem if you start to reach out into your community. And prior to the start of this year, to get a DEA X waiver or data waiver, you had to sit through an eight-hour training course? Correct. It was an eight-hour training course. And I, I basically went through the training course, but then you were allowed to basically give 
uh, suboxone in the emergency room and then dispense a single dose from a rural critical access hospital where I was. So I never actually went through the process of getting the waiver. I simply got the education, understood the process, understood how to treat it. And I felt like most of my providers were interested in doing that. They were interested in starting treatment, giving a dose, but then they didn't want to take on the additional, you know, responsibilities that came with the X waiver where like patients were assigned to your license. And there was a lot of other things that kind of came along with it that made, I think, emergency doctors that are used to not having to basically serve then as like the next step in the follow-up that, that I think are starting to get alleviated by this program and kind of the changes they've made. Yeah. December 29th, 2022, Congress passed the omnibus bill. Uh, which included two acts that are pertinent to the DEAX waiver. One is Mainstreaming Addiction Act, which officially ended the X waiver or data waiver requirement, meaning anyone who has a DEA license, a regular DEA license, can now prescribe buprenorphine, and there's no limitation on quantity of prescriptions, number of patients that you treat, and there is no special requirement for application in order to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. It's just lumped in there. As long as you have a DEA license that allows you to prescribe scheduled substances, then you are okay in using buprenorphine for your patients. Interestingly, there was a second act, the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act, or MATE, which also passed. And what it essentially did was take that eight-hour requirement that was previously only required for DEA X waiver applicants and now make it applicable to all DEA licensed applicants, whether you're renewing or if you're a first-time applicant. And that was an interesting step to take. Understandably, with the opioid epidemic, lots of people who are addicted fentanyl and other opioid type substances everywhere in every community. It's a tremendous problem. There is a, a need for more education and several organizations like the American Board of Addiction Medicine and the American Osteopathic Association Board of Addiction Medicine were attempting to increase the educational requirement and make it required for everyone. There was a lot of interest in this particular act, and there's a lot of debate about adding this because some organizations said, hey, it's great to ask providers to increase their educational requirements or to do this on a state level, but on a national level for the DEA license, an eight-hour course can be burdensome and is going to increase the overall educational requirements for every single provider who applies for a DEA license, regardless of whether or not they're going to be prescribing buprenorphine. And so there was a lot of debate back and forth about whether or not that was a good idea. Ultimately, the act passed. So now if you have a DEA license, the next time you go to renew, you're going to have to sit through an eight-hour course on the treatment and management of patients with opioid or other substance use disorders. And the educational requirement for those who are currently licensed doesn't really take effect until June 21st by law. So between now and then, the DEA is going to try and figure out what that looks like for people who are currently licensed and for future licensees, and more information is still pending. So all we know is there's a coming eight-hour training course requirement, but uh, we don't have any other details yet about when you'll have to have it and what it'll look like and who can provide it. And so interesting that that's coming down the pike, but apparently all of us are going to have to sit through the same training you went through. DR. And I, I would tell you that I thought it was humbling and interesting, and it made me much less hesitant to give Suboxone. And when this passed, you and I talked about it, and I, I think this is honestly a great thing because I think the more that you can give patients access to these kind of medicines, the more they're going to have success in maintaining their decisions to get help and maintaining their decisions to stay off of some of the other things that are very much more addictive than Suboxone is. And I think that the more access we make to these and the easier we make it for people to follow up. I mean, for me, I always worried with our program that if they didn't follow up in 24 to 48 hours, they were going to fall back into that pattern of addiction. And I think for me now, if I can write someone a one week or a two week prescription for Suboxone and a lot of my patients now come in and they're like, look, I, I was on Suboxone. I couldn't get it anymore. If I could get it, I would take that. And they'll even tell you their dose. And I think you don't have to overthink this too much and that, you know, if people know what they want, it's a good drug, it's a safe drug, and it is 
something that is really going to make a difference the more that you do it. And I think this training is going to be enlightening for all of us. And I think that the downside, eight hours is a lot, but I think that usually these things go significantly faster than that. And then I think it'll be a refresher afterwards. It won't be eight hours every, you know, every time you renew your DEA. But I think that if you look at where we're at in terms of, you know, opiates being such a high cause of death, especially among young people in America, the upside of this is almost incalculable in terms of the years that we could get back for people. Yeah, that's good to hear. It's If you're not familiar with buprenorphine as a drug, it is significantly different in pharmacology than something like methadone, which was, most people are familiar with, at least on a community basis. There are people who use methadone on a regular basis for opioid addiction and have to show up at a methadone clinic and get their dose. And that's a very, very long acting opioid. Buprenorphine is really quite different in its agonist and antagonist activity and its potential for overdose and harm is so much lower than something like methadone. And really the eight hour course is meant to give you an understanding not only of the spectrum of opioid use disorder, but also on how this drug works and how it's meant to be used and how safe it is. And just some of the screening criteria you have to ask patients before you give them a dose. And although I didn't go through the program officially with the DEA X waiver, I did actually take part in a few of these courses, and I, I also found them to be very helpful. It'll be interesting to see what the DEA decides by June regarding educational requirements. The law itself stipulates completion of eight hours. It actually says eight hours, and it says with every DEA license renewal and with initial licensure. So I don't think there's going to be much leeway in reducing it for renewals. But as you said, those things usually go pretty quickly and may take less than a full eight hours, depending on how the program is structured. So we'll see how that turns out later this summer. If you're not aware already, there's a blog run by EB Medicine, foamed.ebmedicine.net. And uh, I posted a couple of things there about this already, but we'll keep you up to date there as more information is released from the DEA. Simultaneously, the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice article in January was on opioid use in pediatrics. And honestly, I've never sat down to give this even a second of thought in my practice. I just assume, oh, okay, the person has a painful process. Okay, we're going to give them some pain meds. We'll escalate our pain meds appropriately and we'll just move on. And it seems like a topic that just doesn't really need all that much discussion until you sit down and read through an article like this and go, huh. Yeah, I guess there really is a need for something like this. And there's so much more to it, including opioid addiction in children, but also myths that they diffused. Things like, is it okay to give NSAIDs to somebody who has a bony fracture? I, I remember the days when I was in training when the mantra was no ibuprofen for a fracture. We're going to put you in a splint. You got Tylenol. You got some kind of opioid that I'm going to prescribe for you, but no NSAIDs. And if you have read through the article, they actually mentioned in there that there, yes, that has been completely dispelled. There was a review that included six randomized controlled trials, 600 patients who all had bony fractures, all of them in the pediatric population. And what they found was that as long as the NSAID use was two weeks or less, there was actually no effect whatsoever on bony healing. And that the only people who had a higher risk of non-union were those who were on it for greater than four weeks on a regular basis, and mostly with indomethacin, which honestly I have never prescribed. So it's interesting to read that data and interesting to hear that that mantra is still out there because I do remember in residency training hearing that, and I'm happy to see that it's been dispelled. And I'm also happy to see that they brought it up in the article to remind people that NSAIDs are okay. For sure. The introduction of the article went into some great detail about opioid use and analgesia in the emergency department. Not surprisingly, we have a lot of painful visits to the emergency department. Children are often showing up with injuries, and traumatic injuries from playgrounds and bounce houses and fractures, and that's something we're accustomed to seeing. About 74% of children said they had moderate or severe pain, and this becomes very reminiscent of what I used to see before the opioid epidemic when we were talking about pain scales and measuring pain scales and using some kind of subjective or objective aid like the face scale, even with adult patients. And so there is equal data regarding that in children. And interesting to see that we typically undertreat pain in kids because we 
just go, okay, we've got Tylenol, we've got ibuprofen, and that's kind of where it stops. The opioid use disorder diagnosis in children data was alarming. You know, the, the article said that two-thirds of adults who were treated for opioid use disorder were actually exposed before the age of 25. And I know this doesn't necessarily mean it was in a five or 10-year-old, but still, that's very, very significant. And between 1999 to 2020, there were about half a million people who died overdosing on opioids. And that's a lot of patients. And overall, 90% of the pediatric deaths from prescriptions and illicit opioid poisonings are occurring in adolescents, 15 to 19. But 6.7% of them happened in children under the age of five, which is just mind blowing. Like that, that number of patients who would have a, an injury or a death from an opioid in that age group is just, is just tragic. It's all tragic. All of that data is tragic. So I think the size of the problem in pediatrics was greatly underappreciated by me. I think every time I see a teenager with a sports injury, and I know those hurt, but I really think about those as like, do we really need opiates in this case? Because I, I know young people that got their first exposure to opiates from the teenage sports injury, and that changed the course of their life. And I think that you've got to be very careful with that stuff. You've got to try everything you can do to control pain, but then you've got to be really cautious about the time, the length, and what you're going to do in terms of other things for pain control. And then when it comes to kids, whenever I'm writing a prescription or what, like looking at that, I think about how safe is this going to be? Are the kids in the house going to have access to this by chance? Because I've had parents accidentally leave their THC gummies out and have the, their little kids get into them. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a funny story when they come into the emergency room and they're all giggly, but the exact opposite can happen with some of their opiate pills if they accidentally leave them out. And, and it's real hard to see that in a young kid that they just slow down and stop breathing. So. I think everybody's got to be more aware. And I, I, the same thing here, I think, as this article pointed out, the accessibility of Narcan and Naloxone needs to be as high as possible. Like if you're writing an opiate prescription and someone that you're worried about, like there's no downside to sending them home with Naloxone as well. Yes. So that, that brings up several important points for that population under five. We don't routinely have conversations with patients when we're handing them the prescription. Hey, do you have children at home who are in this age group? And please make sure you lock up this bottle so that there's no access to it for your child. Even though it's going to be an accidental exposure, you can do something to prevent that accident if you're just careful about where you put this bottle. And by the way, maybe all the bottles that you have at home. That's an excellent conversation to be having, even just as a side note with a patient that I do not routinely do. And you also brought up the prescription to an adolescent. We also don't routinely have that kind of conversation with the patient or with their parent of, hey, I'm going to prescribe this medication. It is completely safe to alternate Tylenol and ibuprofen. And if you're okay with that, don't even fill this. But if you need it, it's okay. I'm going to give you a very limited quantity of it. And then maybe just taking it a step further and saying, hey, by the way, tell me, is there anybody in the family who has opioid use disorder? Is there a history of addiction? What's the family environment like? It's just a few more questions to ask in, in that screening process when you're about to give someone a prescription of that sort. And oftentimes, honestly, I get that question from parents. I'm not really getting it from the child or the adolescent. I'm getting it from the parent who's saying, oh, well, you know, you gave them whatever here in the department. How am I going to control this at home? And it's a conversation with them about, well, we're immobilizing, we're doing these things, we're doing ice, we're doing all these extra things that you can do at home as well. And hopefully when you get home, the immobilization will continue to provide pain relief. But if they need something, this is the, the escalating order that we want you to do it in. Do you ever talk to them about like the pain cycles and not letting your pain cycle up? Tell me. Patients, so like a lot of times I'll have patients where like they'll have a fracture or an injury where like I know it really hurts and we'll get them in control in the emergency department, like you said, with everything, maybe sometimes opiates, maybe not, but usually something like an NSAID, Tylenol, and maybe a lidocaine patch and some ice, and then you immobilize them if, if it does need reduction or something else. And then I, I say to them, I'm like, okay, look, you're going to go home. I'm going to give you a long acting NSAID. I like naproxen because I think that instead of trying to remember it every six hours, that's your baseline. So I say every 12, you're going to take this with food so it doesn't upset your stomach. And that's your baseline pain medicine. Then if you're hurting a little, you're going to take one Tylenol. If you're hurting a lot, you're going to take two Tylenol. And then you can consider if it's really severe pain going to something narcotic if you need it. And usually I'll tell people, I don't think you're going to need this. so I'm not going to give it to you. If it's getting worse, we can talk about it. But I think these medicines are really addictive. 
I think I can control your pain with what we've done here. I think it's going to gradually get better over the next couple of days if you keep basically using ice and immobilization and rest. And then you're going to follow up with these people and then they're going to do more to immobilize it or put it in a cast or do something else. And this is the plan we're going to use to make sure that it gets better. And that's how I think we're going to keep you off of these drugs that I think would be dangerous to expose you to. Yeah, perfect. And that took like 30 seconds. And it's, it's the same speech every time. That's excellent. It does raise another good point about making sure that they're staying ahead of the pain and not waiting until they're in severe pain and then they're behind the ball again. Absolutely. And then you also mentioned before the appropriateness of giving somebody a prescription for Narcan, even if it's an adolescent, which again, it's not common, at least in my practice, for me to think about it. Oh, oh hey, this is an 11-year-old who has a forearm fracture and I'm going to send them home with something because it was difficult to control in the ED. Should I also then send mom and dad home with a prescription for some nasal Narcan, which is actually free in our state. So in many states have this available for free, regardless of insurance status, because of this particular issue. And it's not a reflection that they're son or daughter or child is some kind of addict. It's another conversation about, hey, I'm sending you home. You asked about pain meds. I'm telling you about pain meds. Here's the schedule I want you to follow. We all understand these medications have problems and side effects, and here's something to reverse it if you run into something. That's another important step in the process. Absolutely. One of the things that I also recall doing in the hospital was when we built our pain medication dosing guidelines for nursing, it was a process of taking away the old order sets, which included things like, if there's pain, here's Tylenol, here's ibuprofen, here's hydrocodone, here's oxycodone, here's MS cotton, here's IV morphine, here's IV Dilaudid, where the physician just checked all these boxes and there was essentially no stepwise process and the nurse and the patient just kind of had to choose from a buffet of opioids. And where we went back and then deliberately with our pharmacy and therapeutics committee and our opioid use committees had to build a stepwise progression of how bad is the pain? If the pain is this bad, then please start with these. Don't go straight to the IV dilaudid. If the pain is this bad, then, you know, have you already gone through the previous dosing and where are they? And building a stepwise algorithmic approach, which you can use with parents at home in the same way. You can say, hey, just like you did, here is your baseline pain. You're going to do this medication you're going to take twice a day, every day. Here is something else you're going to take for breakthrough pain. If it's really severe, then here's how I want you to escalate doses. That's a conversation. It seems like a pain because you know everything we do is time consuming and some people don't want to put in the time to have that conversation. But I think the data is very clear that that's a conversation that's necessary. And if you're going to write them the prescription for some kind of opioid, then you need to take the extra time and have that discussion and teach them how to escalate that pain management and not just say something like, just use the hydrocodone and now you can go, goodbye. The other thing I think the article did an excellent job of, speaking of dispelling myths, was running through different pain medications and their use in children. Codeine, for example, was one of them, right? I, again, I, being the old person that I am, remember when we were primarily using things like codeine in children, codeine syrups and Tylenol number three, until the data was published that there are people who metabolize codeine differently and that those who are slow metabolizers actually end up having accidental overdose, unintentional overdose and death from using codeine. And those who are rapid metabolizers took it and went, this doesn't really do anything for me. And so there were people all over the spectrum and parents didn't know what their child was on that spectrum. And so they would give an appropriately prescribed dose. And next thing they know, their child is somnolent and not breathing. And so this is actually not recommended at all in children. In fact, the FDA and Health Canada have warnings that advise against the use of codeine in children because of deaths. I basically just tell patients that codeine and Demerol are gone. Sorry, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. no more of that. You That's can't right. have it. You can't have it. That's right. Well, I still see people who who are on Tylenol, Tylenol 3 on a three. regular yeah. basis, right? I mean, yeah. it's just that it's still out there. And Demerol pills, you know, I guess they're they're still available, although we don't use that in children either. So an important note, don't use codeine in your pediatric population. Tramadol is another interesting drug. Very, very dirty <laughs> and not a fan of the drug. 
Seamless for me. That, that's not a thing. We don't do that. <laughs> that's right. We don't do that. Exactly. But this is now some actual evidence base for that, right? Tramadol is considered a low potency synthetic opioid, has been used for children, but it's thought to be equipotent with codeine. It's still an opioid and it's considered a suboptimal choice. The FDA also has a contraindication for tramadol in children under 12. And as well, there is a separate contraindication for children who have had recent tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, those who are obese and those who have sleep apnea or severe respiratory diseases, which is a lot of patients, especially like you see our tonsillectomy patients who have all that swelling in their posterior pharynx, our obese population, which is ever increasing, and those with sleep apnea is, I can't say I see a lot of children with sleep apnea, but I do see a lot who have respiratory disease, are severe asthmatics, and so tramadol is contraindicated in them regardless of age. And honestly, I would just avoid this drug totally in children <laughs> and, uh, and adolescents, or maybe even in adults. The drug, this still has this kind of community feel to it where people say, oh, it's kind of like, you know, hydrocodone light or morphine light. There was a study they did that basically was like, could patients tell the difference between tramadol and Tylenol? And this is done in adults, not in kids, as we're talking about kids. But in adults, patients could not tell the difference between tramadol and Tylenol. So I just, from that and from experience of some of the other dirty side effects of it, it's on my list of drugs that unless it's something that you're already on and you're starting to have some withdrawal from, it's not something that I'm using in my pain arsenal. Yeah. And the drug itself has multiple receptors that it binds, not just our opioid receptors, but serotonin and it affects norepinephrine. And it has so many other effects that are meant to augment how efficacious it is for treating pain. But really all those other things end up creating a host of side effects. So those who are epileptic or have a tendency to seizures have increased likelihood of seizures with tramadol. Those who are on SSRIs have increased chance of serotonin syndrome when they're taking tramadol. It's just got so many drug-drug interactions and so many side effects. It's just that best to, to not even put it in your arsenal, I think. My opinion. <laughs> I think on the positive side of this, I loved the focus they had on Toradol because I feel like there's some hesitation when you look at some of the resources. Toradol is not as well studied in kids, but I would tell you that in practice, it seems like pediatric orthopedic surgeons use a lot of Toradol. And I've found that I'm getting better at giving that an IV Tylenol to kids who are like, really think they might have a surgical emergency. This fracture or this injury, like their appendicitis might need to go to the OR. And I find that doing more of that has given me really good results. Kids do have a lot better pain control when you give them both of those IV. And I feel like parents are like, okay, good. Like we're under control and you make the kid better and the parents better. And then everything's just on a better place. And I think this article reinforced that practice for me that Toradol is a safe choice. I always lead pretty much every time with IV Tylenol if it's someone that I'm trying to keep NPO or PO if I'm not worried about it. But then I felt like Toradol was a nice, more supported second line than I even thought it was coming into this article. Yes. And I think the authors did a great job of really stressing combination therapy. So you could use an NSAID plus Tylenol, or you could use a opioid like morphine or even fentanyl and then augment it with something like an NSAID so you don't have to give as much. I think that was a great discussion in the article and something they stressed very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. They also did a good job of talking about regional pain control. So things like nerve blocks, hematoma blocks, mm -hmm. even topical therapy, ice packs, lidoderm patches, all these kinds of things you can still use in children and are quite effective. And if you look at the clinical pathway, even in the article, it talks about things like trigger point injections, greater occipital nerve blocks for headaches, topical lidocaine for neurogenic pain, peripheral nerve blocks for musculoskeletal pain, peripheral nerve blocks for musculoskeletal pain, topical NSAIDs, topical lidocaine, all these things to augment your pain control for a child that you're seeing in the emergency department, things that you don't really necessarily consider on a regular basis. Have you ever heard of the idea of the pain-free pediatric emergency department? I have. It was, yeah. it was a big thing for a while. And I remember reaching out to a couple of friends that are pediatric and being like, what, you know, what is this? Like, what do you, how, do you, how do you have a pain-free ER? And I felt like there was some like not opiate use thing that went with it. And, but I, 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 once I really started to understand it more, it really is a great idea. Kids come to the hospital and they're hurt and they're afraid. 
What can you do to make it so that their experience is not traumatic and you basically get the things accomplished you need to to figure out what is wrong with them, but do it in the way that is least painful and scary and frightening to them. And it changed my practice and it really started making me want to pursue more of these things. So looking at distractive therapy devices like the Buzzy Bee, I really love those because kids think it's really funny and they don't notice an IV as much. Doing topical lidocaine on a kid where you need labs, but those results can wait 30 minutes or an hour. I think if you have that chance, you should do it. I think some of the other things like the needleless lidocaine injectors are loud and a little scary, but also still work pretty good. And then looking at buffering lidocaine, I find that every day I'm always asking providers, hey, I know it takes another minute or two, but that child or that demented adult that's got a head, big head laceration or that person with special needs that really doesn't understand what we're trying to do here. If you can give them pain relief without giving them that horrible burning pain from the lidocaine, it makes a huge difference. So take that extra 30 seconds or a minute, get the nurses to give you that one cc of bicarb, you pull nine cc's of whatever lidocaine you want through it. And now that acid is gone and it feels completely different. And I've had this done to myself. Buffered lidocaine is so much less painful than normal lidocaine. If you're concerned about how the patient's going to be able to understand the pain that you're going to give them from this, then buffer that lidocaine. Yeah, I could not agree more. I recently had a, a toe injury on my great toe where I, I broke it, but then also had a partial avulsion of the nail and a subungual hematoma. And I actually went to my own emergency department and had one of my own PAs numb this thing and try and put the nail back. And it was just a giant mess. And I remember getting the nerve block with just standard lidocaine. And then the next day, I went to see one of our podiatrists here in town where he had to just remove the whole nail. He was like, this is not salvageable. We're just going to take this off. You'll heal much faster and you'll be more comfortable. And he used buffered lidocaine. And literally, it was like night and day, night and a day. little bit night. of cold spray on the skin and a little buffered lidocaine. I didn't feel a darn thing. And he, he was in there ripping nails off and undoing nail folds and doing all kinds of stuff. And it was just so much more a pleasant experience. That, that yes, I, I yeah, the, the difference is definitely night and day with buffering the lidocaine and using some of those little topical agents. You know, people will do things like pinching skin, rubbing, vibrations, the buzzy bee you talked about. Really, all of these things help the pain of whatever it is you're going to have to do in order to get their pain under control. And yet it really does make a big difference, especially in the pediatric population, but also in adults like I experienced myself. And if you're lucky enough to have one of those child life specialists in your emergency department while the nurse is doing something painful like placing an IV. Oh my goodness, the amount of pain that it will alleviate for the patient, for the parent, for the nurse. I mean, everyone is more comfortable when there's a child life specialist in the room and you have to do something to a child. It's just amazing. And if you've never seen it, I highly recommend you go somewhere and just observe one, look up some of the videos online and just see what they do when the kids are undergoing painful procedures. It's amazing. It really is amazing work. Mm -hmm. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about alternatives to opioids, but I think the authors of the article did a very good and balanced job at saying there are going to be times when you need to give opioids. And there was a whole discussion on don't ignore the amount of pain that the child is having because you just don't want to prescribe opioids. That's, that's an appropriate use of the medication. If you're going to combine it with something else that's a non-opioid, that's totally okay. But there are now lots of other options. So certainly if they have an IV in place, you could give morphine or fentanyl. But there are also intranasal options. So intranasal fentanyl, you ever used that in a child before? I've really started trying to hone my practice in of intranasal ketamine and intranasal fentanyl. Because I think that for small lacerations, for quick little procedures where you need to do a little something but not quite that much, or like a trauma patient where you're, you're just trying to get a kid under control, I think there's a role for that. And I haven't quite perfected it yet, but I felt like this article empowered me to do more of that, especially for young kids, kids that I can tell they're in a lot of pain and I'm not getting control, or I just want good control now, but that's something short acting. I think the intranasal fentanyl is a really great choice. And this made me want to get a little more aggressive with my dosing because I think I'm starting at one usually. And I think there's room to start at two for the people that you think really need it. And there is an excellent table. Table two in the article talks mm -hmm. about analgesic medication dosing for children who are one year old or older. And it starts with things like incense for mild pain, escalates to things like IV medication for moderate pain and then severe pain 
but it includes the intranasal dosing for fentanyl, oral dosing for morphine. You know, that's something I don't actually do commonly in my practice is give an oral dose of morphine, but we have it available in the hospital. So it is something that's available to us in the emergency department. If they don't have an IV and it's not something that you have to attend to right now, an oral dose may work. You don't necessarily have to bring the needle in that scenario. And so there are some good options for intranasal medication, including ketamine. And that table does an excellent job of outlining that dosing. It felt good too, because I liked simplifying things in my practice. And the fact that the adult dosing for morphine and pediatric dosing, that dose is the same. That idea, like 0.1 mg per kilo in my head, I love that, that I can take their weight in kilos and just knock off the second digit if there are only two digits in their weight. But like the idea that a 10 kilogram kid gets one, a 40 kilogram gets four, and an 80 kilogram kid gets eight. And then if that's too much for the nurses, then I can go to something like Dilaudid where they're more comfortable given one of that. I felt like this reinforced that practice that that's still the right thing to do and that kids are just little adults when it comes to morphine. Yeah, it's weight-based dosing. They also did a good job of addressing patients who have to undergo sedation. Now, this is actually true in adults as well, but they were specifically talking about children and there's been an association with pre-procedural opioids in patients undergoing sedation and the occurrence of oxygen desaturation, vomiting, and the need for positive pressure ventilation. And really the point of that discussion is to say that there are going to be those people who you have to sedate to do a painful procedure. They come in in pain. You're going to want to give them something for pain. But in children, if there's less than 30 minutes between the time when you give them an opioid and you're about to go sedate them, then you may want to consider spacing that time because they have an increased likelihood of having complications during the procedure, specifically because the large bolus of opioid is still circulating in their system and hasn't had enough time to equilibrate and now to go in Addison. So if it's been less than 30 minutes, maybe wait longer and then begin the sedation so that you equilibrate with your opioid and then you know how much sedative you're going to have to give for the procedure. Or to the sedative that gives you pain control like ketamine, which... I think is really usually the thing that I'm thinking is, do I want to go ketamine for this kid? And then do I want to give him a little Versed ahead of time so they go into it a little more calm? Or is it something where I think I need opiates and then I go from there? But most all these people for me are getting a little Zofran to pre-treat them and make sure they don't vomit because I find that opiates and ketamine, there's a significant amount of vomiting. And then I just see where we're at and, and what I'm going to do. Most of the time, I really like IV ketamine for anything where I'm going to do a procedure because especially in kids, I think you get good control good pain control, good amnesia, analgesia, and anesthesia. And it's, I think it's the right choice for a lot of kids. Yes. Yeah. I'm a big fan of ketamine. I do like giving it IM if it's going to be a quick procedure instead of IV so that we can skip the IV placement. I have tried it intranasally before sedation, not just for pain management. Mm -hmm. I haven't quite got as good sedation out of it intranasally. It's probably dose related and how much, you know, volume can you really squirt into somebody's nose all at once. But I haven't quite gotten there yet with, with nasal ketamine for sedation. But yes, a very, very safe and effective drug that will kind of hit all of the check boxes for you. I had one laryngospasm where a kid locked his jaw up on me when I gave it IM and I had to do a jaw thrust and I managed to get him to break and we managed to bag him and get him through it. But after that, I'm much more cautious about IM ketamine and I like to really have that IV. So if I need a paralytic, it's a much shorter process to reach for a paralytic from code cart and get it as opposed to place IV, place then IV. get paralytic and everything else. So I am more careful, but, it, but at the same time, it makes me more interested in the intranasal ketamine because your dose is lower. And I think that the a couple of times that I've had it work, the kid was out for like 10, 20 minutes and it was perfect for a little lack repair. And then they were waking up. And it also meant that I could send them home sooner. And whereas the IM, it lasts so long. And I just mm -hmm. feel like I'm committing them to a couple hours of observation until they resolve. So there's an area there that we're still going to figure out. And I hold out some solid hope that, that it's going to keep getting better for kids that come into the ER because we're going to get better and better at this. Yes, completely agree. The article actually did mention there are other medications depending on what it is you're treating. So especially if you're treating headache, things like IV metoclopramide, droperidol, ketamine and toradol or ketorolac, prochlorperazine, lots of options there if you're just treating headache as the primary cause of pain. You've got a child with migraine disorder or abdominal migraines, then these are other options there that are completely opioid-free. Renal colic, toradol, of course, IV Tylenol. IV lidocaine. What's that? 
IV lidocaine for renal IV lidocaine. I love it. IV lidocaine. I've never used it in a child, but. I mean, I haven't seen kidney mm -hmm. stones, but if I saw one, yeah. I'd, I'd, it, it would interest me. I'd have to look and see if there was any data in kids, but it'd be interesting. There are going to be some children with chronic pain or recurrent pain, especially like the sickle cell population, those kinds of children. And they did address that in the article. Again, it did a great job of just reminding us that these people have prescribers for their chronic pain meds and that engaging them in the process is a good idea. Not always necessarily available in the emergency department if it's after hours or weekends, but just something to keep in mind, making sure that they have some kind of plan or care plan that's already set up. If you're in a hospital that has that kind of availability in your electronic health record, those things are fantastic to have set in advance that when this patient comes in, here's our care plan for their pain, mm -hmm. um, not just for children, actually, even for adults. So a good reminder that that's an excellent option and something that needs to be started in advance, not during their initial visit. <laughs> Five things that will change your practice that came out of this article at the end of the article. So integrating lots of different modalities for pain management, the psychological, the distraction, your child life specialists, engaging the family definitely helps decrease the need for pharmacotherapy. Combining acetaminophen and ibuprofen for moderate pain is excellent and equipotent to opioids in most cases. So combining those two or alternating that regimen, even in the emergency department, can give you very good control. Screening children and their families for opioid use disorder before you write the prescription to send them home with is important and can help identify some of those at-risk families. And if you do identify someone who's at risk, but you still have to write the prescription, sending them home with a naloxone kit or giving them that prescription for it, especially if you're in a state where they can get it for free. If you don't know, just type it into Google and you'll know <laughs> pretty quickly. I think the majority of states now have a free naloxone program. And lastly, intranasal administration is safe, whether it's for fentanyl or ketamine or even some of the benzodiazepines. It's a quick and rapid way to deliver medications for severe pain without having to place an IV or even in advance of having to place an IV. So kudos to Dr. Ali and to Dr. Drendel for writing the article. It is excellent, and I highly recommend it. Again, this is the January issue of Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice which is available to you in the mobile app and online at ebmedicine.net. TR, final thoughts? I, I think it's really cool to see progress on this front, and I think that it's a very cool time to be a provider in healthcare with so many options to treat pain, and it sure beats the shot of I am morphine back in the early 1900s. <laughs> That's right. That's excellent. I'm going to take two seconds for a quick plug, if you haven't been to clinicalpathways.evmedicine.net, then you're listening to this podcast now. I want you to complete the podcast and then go check it out. It is basically the interactive version of all of those clinical pathways that we put in the articles for adults, for children, and even for the urgent care articles that are published every month. And it's a new product. It's currently in its beta release, which means it's free to use. So clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net. There even is a method to leave feedback if there's something you like or don't like or recommendations for more. It's basically a stepwise progression through the decisions that you have to make for all kinds of disease processes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, chest pain, abdominal pain, pediatric head injuries. I mean, you name it. We've gone through and put the most common presentations and some of the most recent articles in there. And I really encourage you to go check it out and give us your feedback and enjoy it because it's meant to be there for you at the bedside to help you make that decision pretty rapidly, whether you're in the urgent care or in the emergency department. Thanks, TR. I appreciate your time. Until next time, everybody, be safe. <laughs>